So welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We might have some folks still trickling in a bit. This is the Well of Being at San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm Eve. Really nice to see familiar faces and new folks. And tonight we are going to continue uh, our work with this beautiful text by Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. And we're going to actually take a little bit of a, I don't think it's a detour, maybe it's a deepening. So we've been in the process of learning about his three precious pills, which are actually preliminary to meditation, but essential. So this finding the stillness of the body, the silence of the speech, and the warmth and openness of the mind. And as I think some of you have noticed, it's, it's not as though these can really be kept apart, right? They interweave with one another but it is really nice to give each of them the spotlight. And so last week we really focused on the stillness of the body. And tonight we're gonna focus on silence, which I think is harder. Anybody, silence or stillness? Stillness easier, so silence harder, raise your hand. Yeah, uh, I, was really, I was really hoping there would be a bit more from modern science. But the, the best estimate about how many thoughts we have a day, anybody have a guess? How many thoughts? 80,000, 30,000. 30, anybody else? <laughs> the estimate is actually 6,000. It's, it's a, I, I don't know, the sampling method isn't super great. So they just have someone who's you know a whole variety of people in a scanner for an hour and a half and they extrapolate from there. But because it's unfortunately the nature of psychology, most of the folks in the scanner are of a certain age and demographic and university. So, you know, hard to extrapolate, but at least 6,000. And I do think that even without scientific evidence, we all know that when you sit down to meditate, you get twice as many thoughts, <laughs> right? Like at least twice as many. And so I think it's, you know, especially important um, when we are trying to settle into silence. There's cushions over there and please make yourself comfortable. Um, cushions are in the library, it's like it's there. When we're, you know, trying to do this practice of settling into silence, it can be nice to bring forth another method, another tool. Has anyone in here done the nine purification breaths? This is part that's kind of common in Tibetan Buddhist practice. It's quite simple. You might have done it in yoga. You know, it's the kind of alternate nostril breathing. It is extremely effective, bless you, uh, at helping kind of settle and really bring our mind into the breath. And so what we're going to do is start with actually a brief settling in practice, just a way for us to arrive here. And then I'd like to build up the nine purification breaths a bit together and also build up a little of this overall practice of settling into silence and why we should do that and its import. So we're gonna start, you know, often we start with a bit more practice than discussion, then questions. So tonight we'll start with a briefer practice, some discussion, and then we'll go into these alternate nostril breathing or, or nine um, purification breaths. And, Wangyal Rinpoche teaches these nine purification breaths really often alongside the three pills. It's interesting in this book, he doesn't include it, but it's truly, if you had like the greatest hits album of Wangyal Rinpoche, nine purification breaths would be like the number one title. It's something he teaches all the time. There's a lot of elaboration we can do in the practice, but tonight we're gonna keep it really simple. Um, Please come on in. Okay. All right. I think we have a seat, Mace. So as we find our way, feel free to have a position that's comfortable. We're only going to be practicing in this initial period for maybe 10 minutes or so. Just a little bit of a settling in and helping us to arrive. And for those who are new and for those who aren't new, really just taking a moment and really feeling the space around you. Uh, for folks for, for whom it's their first time, maybe really taking in and just looking 
around looking above and looking side to side. We have Mace who will be at the door, really here to help us feel supported and secure and bearing a chair at this moment. <laughs> Thank you. Like, sorry about this. We're gonna have a new Wednesday night set up. Yeah. So that we can fit more. And you can unhook your chair to give yourself so you're not like butt bumping, but you can have the butt bumping. All right. I think that's, we'll have anybody else wait. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, so for folks who are here in the center, really taking a moment and just feeling the physical space around you, and for folks online, really connecting to your physical space in the home or wherever you might be. And taking a moment to feel a sense of our collective here tonight. Here in the center, we have a sense of one another, both through warmth and sound. And for our friends online, really noticing and feeling the presence of those around you and us here in the center with you. And taking what could be for some of us the very first intentional breath of the day really noticing and bringing kindness and awareness to the breath. And to help us settle a bit more in to this initial phase of being with the breath. We can invite a softening and a relaxing through the muscles and the face, softening the forehead and around the eyes, and softening through the cheekbones and the jaw. And softening through the chest and the belly with the sense of warmth and maybe openness. And as we are breathing in, simply feeling the whole body as we breathe in. And as we breathe out, simply feeling the whole body as we breathe out. No need to imagine or analyze anything, just this direct knowing of the body, letting our mind rest fully right here in the body. We'll revisit these more thoroughly in our next practice, but taking a moment and inviting the stillness of body, the silence of inner speech, and the warmth and openness of mind. 
spaciousness, awareness, openness and warmth. Really notice, be curious about where the mind goes. Don't engage or energize the thoughts, but really notice, is it to the future and planning? Is it the past and rumination? Is it some fantasy or unknown experience yet to come? As we keep most of our attention and awareness on the body breathing, give ourselves this opportunity to notice the quality of the mind, maybe the presence of emotions or the residue of emotions here from the day. Continuing to feel and experience the presence of being in this body, in this breath. And for just a little bit longer, being curious and caring, but curious and precise about where is it that the mind wants to go? What is the quality of that escape or that exploration? See if you can feel the natural refreshment and rest when you return to the body and breath. What does that feel like to re-inhabit the present moment through breath and body after being carried away? Taking a moment, being with the body and the breath. With a kind of curiosity about the experience in the body beyond the physical body. Curious about that layer of emotional residue that might be in the subtle body. Maybe a sense of heaviness or ache. Maybe elation and ease. 
maybe it's neutral. Maybe there's nothing. But giving ourselves a moment to look deeply inward. What is here? What is carried with us from the day or the week? What might we be carrying as part of our pain body? A couple more moments here just observing and seeing if this observation can have a sense of welcoming. Whatever is here is fine, already good, doesn't need to be changed or shifted or moved. Just accommodated by spaciousness, awareness, warmth. Thank you for your practice. Welcome again. You look softer. It's good. Yeah. Something Wangyal Rinpoche talks about a lot is where are we hosting our experience from? So if we're with sadness or if we're with frustration or anxiety, are we hosting it in, like you could imagine, different kind of hosting, a kind of distracted host who is busy doing something else, right? Completely unaware of the experience of the house guests. Or there's the over-exuberant host who's kind of like hovering all over you and like over-analyzing, maybe getting into it. Like, are you okay? What's happening? What do you need? Just kind of almost oppressing you. And then there's the host, right, that, that we're kind of looking for. Spacious, aware, warm. So not aloof, not ignoring us, but also not trying to get like over-involved and also not distracted and unaware. And, you know, really trying to feel that presence with our experience, whatever it is. I was with a, uh, a dear friend and wonderful teacher, Will Cabot Zinn, who some of you may know. And he was saying, I'd rather be with awareness no matter what I'm feeling. Like, I don't want to be, even if it's a terrible feeling, I want awareness. And I think of that as, again, what are we hosting or where are we hosting from? And it can be really tough. Did, did anybody notice it was, it was hard to actually feel what we were feeling? It was not a wasn't necessarily easy to know what we're feeling. And then did anyone have an experience of a feeling becoming revealed because we were present and kind of patient, warm? Yes, a you know, little. I mean, for some of us, I know for me today, there was, there was a, enough emotional energy that I didn't need to like go searching for it. Like I, it's here. There was a, 
end of the day engagement interaction that was like awkward. I can't even put my finger on it. It was just, I think I felt misunderstood or, you know, like, ah, oh, this doesn't feel right. And <clears throat> I feel it like the kind of a whole body jumpsuit I'm wearing, you know, like it's just there. <clears throat> it's not the only thing I'm experiencing, but it's with me. And when I sit to practice, it's can, there's a tendency we often have to try to avoid those. I'm here to practice. I'm going to focus on this breath or spaciousness and whatever else I'm going to ignore and avoid. And when I think of settling into our speech or settling the speech in its natural state, that doesn't mean kind of like forcing it down <laughs> all the feelings, all the thought, all the 6,000 thoughts, right? There's a, a different place in which we are orienting towards either our body, our speech, or our mind. So we're kind of hosting, being present with that in a very different way. And I think especially with settling the inner speech, you know, the instructions are always so simple, like just rest in effortless silence. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then what? <laughs> Right. It, it doesn't last that, you know, there is, there can be that moment. And I do like to think of it as, you know, I've been using the language in the last couple of weeks of what are we preferencing? So there is silence, even when there's the ongoing thought streams or kind of emotion stuff bubbling up, there's still silence there. We're just not preferencing it. Right? We're kind of leaning towards this content. So it's, a different stance, a different um, mix analogies, different way of hosting, different way of like standing or holding, whatever is arising for us. And the stance is I'm preferring or I'm standing with the silence. So whatever arises isn't the center. It's where kind of I go to, but I can also come back to this sense of silence. And it is, it does feel a little bit like a Zen Cohen, this idea of there is silence amid everything. There is silence in all the sound. Um, but what that means in a way, especially when we're kind of settling the speech into silence, is we're inviting, you know, it's so interesting how Wang Gel Rinpoche, he really pairs each of these precious pills, the stillness, the silence, um, and the warmth and openness. He pairs them with these different qualities. So last week, the stillness was the unbounded sacred space. So that's space. And it was, we had such a wonderful conversation around space as we often do here. And what does space actually feel like in the body? And what does space feel like as it you know, maybe radiates out or exists beyond the periphery of the physical body? And with inner silence, the quality is the, you know, kind of light of infinite awareness. So there's space and light and such a beautiful, like subtle qualitative difference between the two. We can know that we're mostly in space and, and not in the silence if we feel spacey, but no clarity. So it can be really nice, like really nice to be spacey without clarity. Anybody like that? It's good stuff. It's not meditating, um, but it's really nice. You're just kind of like, yeah. And we can actually, unfortunately, really mistake that for practice. And then we're like training in spaciness. And, you know, um, my teacher would say we're we're practicing for reincarnation as a cow if we do that. <laughs> I don't quite know how that works, but I I, I believe her. Um, so I think we don't want to train that when we sit and to meditate, we feel the space and we just stop there. You know, just in this. I mean, it's great. It's much better than resting in like tension or agitation. But we don't want to just stop there. And I'm curious, does anybody kind of, is there like a sense of what that light, that light of awareness feels like is somehow different than space? Does that resonate for anyone? Yes. Oh yeah. Can we, oh, thanks. 
Cody saw it as an action. Yes. <laughs> so this won't uh, make you loud in the room, but just so folks on the Okay. Yeah. So um, maybe what I took from this idea of spaciness is in between, mm. um, not really kind of settled. So it's sort of in between thoughts, but not necessarily grounded in anything. Mm. Um, so it's almost avoidant mm. and not wanting to kind of anchor. Mm. Yeah. And do you feel is like a awareness or light of awareness? Does that have a gestalt? Again, these are just words to point, but does that have a sense for you? Ooh, I think maybe when that feeling of anchored this mm. yeah. comes in is sort of that feeling of light. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'd never thought of it that way. Um, I can really try that out as like a, a way to describe the sense. I mean, also, and I've definitely fallen into this trap, we think light and we literally think like there's going to be light behind our eyes, right? Of space and light. And, and the thing is, and I know folks here have shared this, sometimes in practice, we do see light. That actually does happen. That's probably part of um, something becoming unblocked in our energy body. So there can be light, but it's not light as in illumination in a physical sense. It's light as in knowing. So there's something about openness, the kind of spaciousness that can be unknowing. It's not yet and I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm just going to use the fancy terms because sometimes the fancy terms really land. It's going <clears throat> from kind of the unborn or the unmanifest into just like some sense of awake awareness, right? So that's, and then we move into manifestation. So that's the, the trajectory there. And so I think yeah, building the layers onto silence so it isn't just stop thinking. Because <laughs> it's so hard to stop thinking. And it can make, I would say, of the billion or so people I've met who say, meditation doesn't work for me. I'm like, oh, really? Like, which one of the 10,000 practices, <laughs> right, that are available, like, didn't work? Most people are relating to, I just didn't like not being able to stop my thoughts, because without meditating, most of us don't even know that that is a problem. Maybe if we wake up at night or we're going through like an acute loss or transition, those thoughts are like, we really recognize that we don't have control over them. But most of the time, unless you're meditating, the fact that you don't have any control over your thoughts and they incessantly come, is not something we need to pay attention to because we can distract ourselves away from that amazing it's like trying to cover up a waterfall with like i don't know like all sorts of other garbage that's also running down the river right and there's a there's a way there's a one analogy of like how do we clean up the stream you know how do we clean up the mind and it's not at the very bottom like picking out the leaves and, and the twigs it's going up to the top where it may start to be polluted so we kind of have to go to the very kind of root essence of awareness um, and find some even momentary comfort, refuge, or home in awareness itself. And then we're not efforting so hard to make the silence happen. So I'm saying all this as a, a proposition, not this is what it is, but this is what we can look for in practice. Like if we can find that sense of settling into the space, finding through the stillness of the body, some silence, is there this kind of light of awareness that arises? And as I mentioned, I, I think it's worthwhile to give ourselves, I don't really consider it training wheels, but scaffolding maybe of the breath practices. So often, you know, as a way to settle speech, we'll follow the natural rhythm of the breath. So the natural rhythm of the breath. And again, if there's one thing that maybe is harder than settling the thoughts and having them go away, it's 
following the natural <laughs> right? Also really hard to do. Um, and so to use a practice that's a bit more um, kind of tangible, this nine purification breaths, it's a really good way to help us get into the breath, get into the body and have that opportunity to experience silence. So at a very simple level, wrote notes, I get this right. Sometimes I start with the wrong side <clears throat> and it's all, it's, you know, with Wangel Rinpoche again, especially for folks who haven't been here just to honor this teacher and his lineage coming from the Bon tradition. Um, so this indigenous tradition out of Tibet, and there's a lot of specificity in these practices and his commitment, his, his Dharma is really to make it simple. And I am going one step further and trying to make it even more simple. So we'll keep it simple with these. <clears throat> the posture in which we hold our hands is we have the thumbs at the base of the ring finger. And then we have the left on top of the right. And that's where we start. So that everybody online, can you all see that? <clears throat> Oops, I had it on my pinky, but ring finger. <laughs> And at the simple level, and then I'll give you a little more explanation. We start with the right hand and we put the ring finger on the right nostril, right hand, right nostril. And we inhale here. And then we switch to the other side, left nostril and exhale. Do it one more time just for good measure. Inhaling on the left side. And exhaling. And when we do this, we just naturally breathe a little slower and we pay more attention to our breath. It has been found to also really support a calming of the nervous system to slow our breath in any way. And this is one of the many practices you hear talked about kind of under the rubric of breath work in contemporary times. But in Tibetan Buddhism, there is so many breath practices. You can, um, maybe folks are familiar with Wim Hof breathing. A lot of those practices are actually drawn from the Tumo practice in Tibetan Buddhism, where you raise up the inner heat and you read these amazing accounts of, um, I was just reading, in Tulko Ergen Rinpoche's biography of him going to this um, nunnery in Eastern Tibet and in the kind of plateau of snow, these women practicing <clears throat> with sheets that are dripped in water and pulled over them so they become ice and practicing this breath that allows it to just radiate and steam off of them. Again, just one account, but quite inspiring. So just to see that inner heat and fire we can develop from the breath. And for, um, for Wangyo Rinpoche, you know, he's really, he's focusing um, kind of specifically that when we are, especially doing this first side, this nostril where it's come on the right, when we're exhaling, we're exhaling and releasing frustration, anger, aversion like specifically that quality did anybody meet anger aversion or frustration when you're meditating did that was that something that was here with you okay so the invitation with these breaths the reason that's a purification breath and helps us prepare for practice so we can release right through the exhale <clears throat> and then when we'll do the left side that's when we are going to um you know as we exhale through the right, we're exhaling attachment, greed, and desire. So anyone relate to desire? <laughs> Craving, like kind of wanting it to be different, wanting this, wanting that other thing. So we're gonna just like release that entirely. That's what we'll do. <clears throat> and then we will place our hands back in our lap after we do three first on the right side, three on the left, and then we do three, just lengthening our inhales, and lengthening our exhales. And with this one, we can use a little bit of an imagination of imagining the breath traveling up the midline of our body, 
and then we imagine it traveling back down. For those who are familiar with central channel, that would be like traveling up the central channel and down the central channel. For those not familiar with central channel, don't worry, don't have FOMO, won't change anything, but that is the instruction of the breath. And in this, um, <clears throat> we exhale out the very kind of root of all of these difficult uh, emotions or experiences, which is delusion, ignorance, not seeing things clearly. Like we can't be angry, we can't have desire for actually clear, right? So I definitely, I love it when you try to apply practices to your life, but it's not like quite the right time. So this afternoon when I was feeling misunderstood and I wasn't, I don't know if I was sad or frustrated, maybe like feeling one and then the other back to back. And I was like, it's okay. It's just feeling like have no preference for it. Probably you're not seeing things as they are. And I was like, yeah, but I'm sad and mad. <laughs> like, but I'm still sad and mad right now. Um, and so I was looking forward to having a time to do this practice together and really invite the release, right? Invite the release through these exhales. So it's so useful for us to have material to work with. So did anybody, as their our first settling practice, not find juicy material in either your thoughts, or your feelings, or your body? You find some stuff there that's worth purifying? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, so if folks want to, we can just stand up for a minute, because we're now going to do a bit of a longer practice, starting off with the purification breath. Friends online too. You can totally just stay standing in practice. That's a very reasonable <laughs> posture, but otherwise. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And I know it's a little unfamiliar, so we'll only hold it for the first part of the practice, but please do place <clears throat> thumbs just at the base of the ring finger, left on top of right. And really find the dignity of your meditation posture, find the uprightness of the spine, and find the softness and the ease through the front of the body. And so gently bringing the right hand up and placing the right ring finger on the right nostril. And then gently inhaling. And then switching, covering the left nostril, exhaling through the right. Coming back to close the right nostril and inhaling.
And as you exhale, releasing anger, frustration. And one more time, closing the right nostril, inhaling. And exhale, releasing anger, frustration. And releasing the right hand down, bringing the left hand up, left ring finger on left nostril, inhaling through the right nostril. And exhaling. Once again, closing the left nostril, inhaling through the right. Closing the right and exhaling. Desire and greed and clinging. And inhaling through the right nostril. And exhaling through the left, releasing. And then releasing both hands into the lap, inhaling through both nostrils. And exhaling, releasing delusion, ignorance, inhaling once again. And exhaling, release. And one more time, inhaling in. And exhale. Now releasing the hands as is comfortable to be in the lap. And continuing to follow the breath now that the breath has been made more apparent. Inviting this quality of silence as we settle the inner speech and follow the natural rhythm of the breath. Maybe there's just a moment or two here where silence is more prevalent than thought. Rejoice in that. And whenever a thought arises, just gently release, and relax, and return, following the natural rhythm of the breath.
And as we gently return and continue to follow the breath, we can become aware of the natural stillness of the body. We're not going anywhere, we're not doing anything. Body is allowed to be fully here, saturated with our awareness. Even with eyes closed or softly open, see if you can shift the gaze from outward looking to inward being and seeing. Getting carried away by thoughts, memories, and images. Such a wonderful training ground for us to really experience the homecoming. Being in the stillness and spaciousness of the body, the silence and awareness, settling the inner speech. Maybe some glimpse that these are the true and natural states of the body and speech. We'll do one more round together of the purification breaths. So placing the thumb at the ring fingers, left hand on top of the right, bringing the right ring finger to the right nostril and inhaling through the left, switching nostrils and exhale. Switching nostrils, inhale. And exhaling through the right. One more time, switching. And switching. Replacing right hand, left hand. Ring finger to left nostril, inhaling through the right. Then switching, exhaling through the left. And switching. 
and switching one last time. Both hands in the laugh, inhaling, lengthening through both nostrils. And exhaling. Twice more so you can hear the breath on inhale and exhale. Last time. Releasing, finding home in the breath, settling the speech into silence. Feel or imagine the sense of the light of our awareness. Even amid the thoughts coming and going. And invite now this quality of the mind in its natural state. Warm and open, spacious, luminous. And continuing our practice of settling the mind in its natural state, we make our primary anchor awareness itself. And notice when thoughts or memories or image arise as much as possible without energizing them or following them. We simply notice them and return to the greater space of awareness. We may not know where to look when we are settling in awareness, resting in awareness. So allow that to be an open consideration and just feel the presence of awareness everywhere, in the body, around the body. And considering that awareness is not necessarily located between the ears, behind the eyes, but all around us. Just that sense of luminous light rising up from the unbounded space. A 
Resting in awareness could feel just like ease, clarity, openness. You can experiment by deliberately bringing a thought to mind and then noticing the space from which the thought arose. Bring a simple thought such as, this is the mind, or I am here. Noticing the body, feel or imagine a sense of the body of awareness. Not up and out and away from the body to be in awareness, the body saturated with awareness. Just a moment or two more refreshing this interest and inquiry into the natural state of the mind, considering the possibility that the natural state of the mind <clears throat> is awareness, not thought. Thank you for your practice. So as a reminder for our regulars and an invitation to folks who might be newer here, 
part of what makes the Dharma Collective a collective is each of us and the great generosity of showing up here with one another and for one another. And I certainly learn a lot and feel deeply enriched by the reflections, questions in the room. I do believe it's an essential part of our practice. And in order for it to be that way, every single time we get together on a Wednesday, we reconstellate as though for the first time. And in doing so, this unique combination of beings, it will never quite be the same as tonight. So we really have that kind of freshness and newness. And with that, my invitation, maybe even requirement, is that you show up here with each other and for each other with great compassion, compassion in body, speech, and mind. So in how we are listening to one another, how we might be speaking or sharing, really trying to do so with as much care and kindness as possible so folks can really feel a sense of belonging and support in being here. If you're not into it, you can you can wait in the waiting room there. But uh, if you stay, I assume you're into it. Yeah? Right? Friends online? Great. All right. I would love to hear any reflections or questions on our deepening practice into silence, purification breaths. Isn't it weird how one nostril is like more weird? Yeah. Wang Yom has all these theories about it too, but I won't get into it, um, that are really interesting about like where you're holding on more. And if we go to the next level, which I'm not sure, there's actually different colors of light that we breathe in and out. But that's kind of like rubbing your head. It's like a little too many things. So I started us, it's already a lot. And I will say, just said I'd ask for questions, but one more thing. It can be really tough with the alternate nostril breathing as you get used to it, to not just feel tight. Like, wait, uh, uh. But at a certain point when it becomes familiar, it really does start to feel quite easeful. Uh, did anybody notice after the practice, there's kind of like a nice feeling? In Pretty good, right? It's like a very cheap high. Yeah. And like very wholesome, you know? It's just, that's, you know, soothing our central nervous system. It's very simple, very easy. And, you know, these practices that are designed to support us in being able to sustain and connect with awareness. And, they, and it kind of, kind of works. Of course, it gets, you know, filled up with thoughts, but it is a nice kind of glimpse at that feeling. So yeah, thoughts, reflections, questions. We can hand you the mic so folks on mic, yes, please. Thank you for the meditation, Eve. Mm -hmm. um, today I realized that when I'm able to sit or, or you know, the intention is on silence. I notice that, you know, the awareness does become more available. Mm -hmm. And the sensation of light in the sense that you were talking about earlier, but also in, in, in a sense of matter, mm -hmm. my body feels lighter, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I'm realizing that the more awareness or the more my awareness expands, the lighter I feel or the more, you know, the more silence I am aware of, the the less physical body I feel, mm -hmm. especially when I'm in pain. So, yeah. and, you know, recently I've been having a bout of pain. And so in today's meditation, I realized that, that the, the more I become aware or more in silence, that my physical body or or you can say the sort of body becomes more yeah. expansive yeah. and the you know my feeling of matter becomes less and less so so yeah that was a Beautiful. very nice conversation today. thank you thank you for sharing Does anybody have that sense as well the nods yeah and again um i only i it's I only bring it in to reflect beautifully, but 
when you think about Buddhist practices, right, and a lot of the terms that are used and a lot of the kind of, I say, fancy language, it's not as though it was just mm, created, like, oh, let's think of a great name for this. It really is the process of such deep introspection. Like, what does it feel like to rest in awareness? What does the body of awareness feel like? And it is really interesting that each of us can become like contemplative scientists, right? Really curious about the felt experience in our body of matter, mind, consciousness, whatever word. And what you're describing, so in, in Wangel Rinpoche's uh, kind of details, he talks about the body of silence as Sambhogakaya, which is very much the body of light. And again, it's not like, oh, you win, you got the right thing, but like, wow, you noticed, right? What has been noticed for thousands of years. And I think it's just very, um, can be very affirming to know that these ideas or concepts can meet our experience as opposed to trying to find them. Like, oh, I've heard of some book. Can I reach that? Can I feel that? Um, but it is quite interesting, that sense of lightness in the body and kind of less materiality in the body and it being a really helpful way for us to be with pain, right? Physical pain. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yes, God is. I have a very different experience today. Um, a lot of worms, but no light. It almost felt like I'm surrounded by warm water. Mm. That feeling of melting water, but not illuminating. Okay. Partially because maybe I have dark materials, and but I still feel very much opening because I think. If my experience yesterday and today was more like in this fight and flight mm. situation where I experienced a lot, I kind of want myself to cry or have emotions, but I'm mentally, I can't experience. Oh, but in this meditation, mm. there's, I kind of gradually felt like the awareness started like dot by dot and <laughs> expanded in my body mm. it's very different mm. from spaciousness yeah it's 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 also very different from stillness mm -hmm. it's silent and it's like permeating in the body yeah yeah mm, beautiful thank you yeah and i think i love that like dot by dot it kind of reminds me of like you know those rays of sunlight that can poke through the clouds you know and the clouds you know that spaciousness it's it's nice, like that warm water feeling. And it sounds like, especially when there is a lot of emotional content, you know, or things are are up for us emotionally and we can't quite feel it. It is, you know, there's a really interesting kind of observation in contemporary science of emotion that when we suppress our emotion, we're not just suppressing what feels bad. We're like suppressing all of our experience, like good and bad. And it kind of it kind of creates this low level tension, um, and it makes it somewhat hard or difficult to access our authentic experience and awareness. Right, like all of our experience is an awareness. So if some part of us is kind of holding something back, it can be hard for awareness to shine through. Yeah, and then there is like the right time to, you know, completely cry and melt and lose it, and then right after that. I, I, this last retreat I was on with some folks here in the room, a lot of crying, a lot of like real ugly crying. And um, <laughs> that was uh, honestly, the sits I had right after that were just spaciousness aware. Like it was like, wow, like that scrubbing. Because a lot of, you know, and Wangil Rinpoche talks about this, like what's in the way of spaciousness and awareness? Well, it's like all of our unmetabolized pain and material that's kind of distracting us either intermittently or kind of in a more significant way, you know, like we're tamped down or suppressing or like this thing comes up or that thing comes up. So it really is so important for us to obviously tend to our inner emotional life. And so much of this book, which is about soul retrieval is like bringing the essences from the natural world to help heal like where we've gotten lost along the way, where we've 
identified with this contracted pain body and lost access often to our authentic emotions in just a simple way. Like, yeah, this is sadness. This is fear. This is anger. And instead of that complication of like, I shouldn't feel this way and why that person make me, like, how can we really meet that and hold it in awareness? So yeah, thank you. Eve, Ron has a question. Okay, great. Did that startle you? <laughs> or comment. <laughs> Hi. Good. It was, Ron, you used to, like, it was good. It was loud in the room. So it was a good startle for everybody. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> Oh, um, a, a question. Yeah, just I want to ask about one one of the instructions. Um, I don't want to set it up. Um, so I, I've um, I've had a lot of uh, excitement slash anxiety this week, and so the proliferation of thoughts in my uh, in my in my uh, meditations has been a lot. And this was yeah. the most silence I've experienced in a in meditation in a while. Thank you. And um, the the two um, instructions that 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 uh, like I've heard this instruction to turn my gaze from outward to inward before, and I've it's always not made sense to me because you know I'm just I've kept my eyes closed, right? <laughs> and 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 this time it worked, right? And mm. it, 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 I went in into some you know emptiness it, it brought me into some emptiness and then the other the other instruction was when um we did the experiment with a thought um and i'm just curious of the intention but what i'm because I, I think i get it um so when we had the in, in, you know uh experimenting with a thought and and paying attention to where it came from and and i saw immediately that it came from silence which connected me mm -hmm. deeper to the silence that just pointed it out as mm -hmm. a perfect pointing out instruction um, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to, to notice the silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. The uh, it's interesting. I'm so glad it landed the kind of inner gaze instruction. And, and I really relate to that struggle of what do you mean? Like look at, you know, look inward, my eyes are closed, I am inward. And, you know, I did notice just recently for myself in the last couple of weeks, just this energy of like looking out, you know, when you're like looking, there's like a seeking energy. And then there's actually with your eyes open, there's like a seeing. And so that I brought that in a little to the instruction. And I think it's something we can practice in you know, in our day to day, when we're kind of like that, that searching, like even if I'm exaggerating it with my body, but we're like looking out towards, like trying to get, and then there's the seeing. It's just so different. And often we naturally fall into seeing just because we're not seeking. And so to bring that into the practice where even with our eyes closed, we're like looking, you know, there is that energy of like looking and then you know, and there's this classic instruction of awareness turning back to look at itself, which we're not doing yet. That's, I think, uh, maybe four, four to five weeks away because I think it's worth building up to it. But that is even, that's like a really wild turn. Like, what does it mean for awareness to gaze upon itself? Because right now we're still, we're like hanging out and like loosening into awareness, but there is a bit of a subject object. We're not just totally, uh, maybe some of us are, losing ourselves in awareness. There's something we're aware of, the thoughts or whatever else. Um, and then, yeah, I, I love bringing in this experiment. Uh, it's, again, I cannot remember which great ancient master, and if anybody knows, please say so, but this idea of, you know, all of these inquiry questions of, what is the color of the mind? What is the shape of the mind? And then one other way into trying to discover the nature of mind itself is bring to mind a word or an image. I learned this from Alan Wallace, uh, who I bring up a lot because he's just such a beautiful translator of Tibetan Buddhism and, and these teachings. And he'll often say, you know, bring to mind an image of a banana. 
and I just can't. I just like start laughing. I'm like, how big is the banana? Is it brown? Is it yellow? Is it a whole bunch? You know, like I, it's too much. And so it's like, what's the, you know, because, but I like the idea of like, you see it, like, where did it come from? And it's beautiful, Ron, that with the kind of, you know, this is the mind, which is another prompt Alan uses that you could see where it came from. I'm like going like this, it doesn't actually come from anywhere, but it is an interesting inquiry. And, and mostly our thoughts are so fast, right? We talked about this little last week, Tom, you know, the thoughts are so fast that we don't really, we don't see where they're coming from. But sometimes in practice, when we slow down, we do like it's, they become more like an arrow. We're like, oh, there it is, or like a shooting star. And we start to actually feel them. We can like see them coming. It's such a trip. Gives us a real good sense, um, as you described, Ron, of the emptiness of thought. You know, that they're just coming and going. They're not some sort of fixed, ever important reality. And this idea that we are not our thoughts. I know it's absolutely philosophy 101, but it's still it's like a big aha to me every time I actually feel that. Uh, not just know that. Thank you, Ron, for sharing. Any other? Yes, please, Rosa. Thank you. Um, I after the fit, I felt a little bit sticky, mm. and um, I think it's because there was some like fantasizing, some like playing out some scenarios in my head. And I wonder, like, is that, and, and when you said like that seeking energy, yeah, right? Like that seeking, like, yeah. like ooh, at yeah. first, like seeing a yeah. little bit. Um, is that the spaciness that you were referring to? It, it can be. I mean, there's so many amazing ways that we get lost in our mind. Uh, the spaciness is usually a little more dull. So the kind of, um, you know, often... The very simplified instruction, if we're applying the introspection, if we notice the dullness, then we kind of invite more vividness through the inhale. But if we notice kind of the uh, proliferation, which sometimes is agitated energy, like, oh, like, what am I going to do? And sometimes it's like pretty fun, you know, like, yeah. what's going to happen? Like, what about this weekend? And oh, wow, you know, it's Losar, it's, you know, New Year. What are we, you know, that can be like really fun energy. Yeah. But it's still, um, yeah, it's still distraction, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, though, because I don't know, I find it, I'm not sure which I prefer, but I think dullness is very hard to work with, like when we're really tired, mm -hmm. like all of us, it's like our chronic condition that we're so tired, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but that busyness gives you a little bit more to work with, mm -hmm. you know, and so there really can be there's two instructions I like, and, and one is the kind of like gazing back, but there's also the real like leaning back in your mind. Mm. And then another is almost imagining, it's a different analogy, but that there is a stage mm. and the thoughts are just arising in front of the curtain and then going back. Mm. So just kind of just, you know, get that level of decentering, be the kind of psychological term from the thought and not totally fused with it. And often the best way to do it is relaxing in the body. Mm. So, cause when the mind is really busy, that's why with the agitation or the proliferation of thoughts, we release through the exhale mm. and then come back. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, good question. Yes, Josh. Uh, so many things that sort of like been dashing around this for me and I've been thinking about it uh, here is like, you know, there are languages where there are 17 different words for love, you know, it seems like there should be 17 different words for awareness almost. And I was contemplating reactive awareness mm. versus proactive mm. um, awareness and how different those concepts are. Mm. And, and yet, you know, is awareness the entirety mm. and, is, or is it reflective, you know, and is what you were saying, that's like the next step. I mean, yes. and are we like, for me, I think reactive awareness is easier to understand and to fall into like the bells ringing at eight o'clock um, versus the proactive awareness of, you know, 
how I'm taking the mic and consuming time here and how is it making everybody feel? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and so anyway, I mean, it's just interesting. I mean, I'm, it's a question really of like, are there these different, like, are there different words for this sort yeah. of the bendability of awareness? Yeah, wow. Such a good question and such a great space of inquiry, right? To really get curious about space of mind, natural state of mind. You know, awareness is like very much, I don't know how, again, it's hard with analogies, but there is nothing prospective or reactive in it. That's still the thoughts arising within awareness. So when we're really touching into or resting in awareness, it doesn't like have any flavor, doesn't have any contour. You know, it is like the prism. And so the light that comes through radiates as a rainbow. So it's clear, it's crystal like our awareness. And so then what you're noticing and really starting to feel is like, what is, I don't want to say obstructing, but like, what's the particular flavor of light coming in through that crystal? Right. What's the kind of thought that's coming and then radiating in this way or rate and recognizing, I mean, I, I think I've at times made a whole kind of, um, what's the word almost like family tree of thoughts, like the thoughts about the future, the thoughts about the past, but what type of past, recent past, more past, right? React like all the different ways often that are self related concerns manifest up into the space of the mind and then like influence or color awareness. And so I, that's at least the way um, I have learned and been able to see that specificity of what is coming into awareness. And I do think it's interesting. I wouldn't do it during practice that kind of, we do like a little labeling sometimes here of what kind of thoughts arise but you're hitting the subtle layer of it. It's not just the type of thought, like what's for dinner or why did I say that, <laughs> right? Or like, am I hot right now or am I cold? It's, the, it's how that actually shifts our mind. So not just the type of the thought, but how that feels different in the mind, which, yeah. If, if you are a true psychonaut and explorer of consciousness, it's like the coolest of questions, I think. Really being able to start recognizing these, these flavors and these shades that kind of come through um, awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Mace. <laughs> That just made me think. Um, I was asking myself what was driving my thoughts. Mm, yeah. I was doing a little inquiry. Yeah. And regardless of the past, present, or future, what type planning, there's a lot of planning. Um, wow. <laughs> it's all about safety and belonging. Yeah. All of them. Like, yeah. I can tie them all into, like, oh, I don't feel totally whatever safety really means, right? Like, we can, you could teach like 20 classes on that. Yeah. Um, and then like, yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, so a little moment of compassion with I that. I love that. And that's, you know, I think, again, like in other kind of eras of, of class here, you know, we spent a couple weeks really focusing on like shaking hands with the body, shaking hands with emotion before we started practice. Because the hope is to like, can I feel belonging and connection in this body? Because if we can't, and in this room, right, if we can't, it is going to definitely show up throughout our practice. And I don't know if I, I shared this last week, but a colleague of mine recently was a, a stress researcher. She said the opposite of stress is feeling safe. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I just love the simplicity of that, right? And, you know, stress is an umbrella term for many different emotions. But that idea of this core sense of how do we establish a sense of safety so that we can settle a little like it's such an important factor for silence and i'd be so curious mace if when you do feel safe 
<laughs> when when we when you do feel safe, like maybe the kitties and like it's like the real perfect environment where there's actually a sense of safety, is there a different quality of awareness? Oh, I never really feel safe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. And then <laughs> if that is the case, right? Like how, how do you kind of like your, that, that's a very like thought based reality. So like, what's the way in through the body? You know, maybe it's like in very hot water, like in a hot tub, like, is there a quality of mind, even though you're not meditating? that just feels different. Like, how do we get a glimpse of what it feels like to be at ease, connected? Because safe is a pretty high bar. Safe's a pretty high bar. Depending on our background, our origin, you know, um, our embodiment, it can be very difficult to say like, oh, you can't meditate unless you're safe. It's like, cool, thanks. Well, I'm <laughs> never gonna happen. But how can we feel, you know, connected? And then for me, that's spacious. Right. Beautiful. So May said for folks online, May said, uh, no, no, she said like, that's like, when can she feel connected and it's spaciousness out in nature. So that's obviously the essence that we're going to be calling in for you here, right? Is space. Um, yeah. So actually, Chris, I wanted to follow up on your question from last week about Mindstream, but you can still go get tea. Sorry about that. But um, another way that Mindstream is used is to describe the continuity of consciousness across lifetimes. That's thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I didn't know whether. I wasn't sure whether it was one or the other, but it's both. Both. Yeah. And then I was reading again this Tulka Organ Rinpoche book, and I was like, oh, right, that version of Mindstream. So. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, while I've got the mic, I want to share something that's that, now that you put me on the spot. Um, I, I'm having this experience where I made a conscious decision to change my schedule so that I had more time hmm. for practice, yeah. stillness. And then practice and stillness came in and changed my schedule hmm. so that I have even more time for practice and stillness. <laughs> and the more time I sit in practice and stillness, so more my schedule is conforming. Hmm. That's wonderful. So, yeah, and I think there's quantum physics to support that. <laughs> yeah, and I do think that's a nice way to maybe kind of round out a little bit of this um, this evening, which is it really can feel like I know for some folks in the room hearing about people's experience of spaciousness and light is like, oh man, you know, like it's hard or can be defeating. And it really is tough for us to sit down and practice if we aren't addressing our entire life as practice. Like it just doesn't really work. Like it, That'd be like, eating Cheetos and strawberry milk most of your life. And then you have one salad and you're like, why isn't this working? You know, like it's like, we actually have to kind of really address all the things that kick up or activate what's in the way of our practice. You know, that is kind of a commitment to, to this work. And it's really great when you get a glimpse of the awareness or of, of the preciousness. So it reminds you why we're doing this. Like, to, because again, like if we can host our experience, whether it's interacting with others or being with ourselves, if we can host that experience from more space, more awareness, more warmth, we are going to be such a better experience for everybody and so much more contributing to this world in a beneficial way. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. And in that I, I often use this term that I love, the kind of natural renunciation that starts to happen for us when we kind of feel as Chris is describing that, wow, spaciousness and stillness is a priority. And then other things just become a little bit less attractive over time. And that's a very beautiful thing to honor. Uh, so let's take a moment to dedicate the merit of our practice.
So what is very likely the best part, the most important part of our practice together is how we can use this as kind of transformative fuel to help us and to help others. So really feeling for a moment the body and any presence that we have in the body of connection, maybe inspiration, insight. And whatever we have generated here together tonight, we place our hands together in front of the chest. That feels comfortable as a symbolic offering of everything that we've gathered here together. May this be in service so that all beings could experience love and belonging. That all beings could feel ease and peace. So that all beings of all time could be free. Thank you all so much. Um, Next week, it's Valentine's Day here, and we have some very special things planned for the evening. If you would like to join us and or bring friends, definitely going to do a theme of love in our practice and definitely appropriate for you and your beloved, which is you, or you and your beloved, which is another, or you and your beloved, which is many others, whatever configuration we are going to have. Um, San Francisco, we are going to have, um, <laughs> I was going to say, but we can't bring our, we can't bring our pets. Um, otherwise that'd be really great. We're going to transform this space. I'll leave it uh, elusive for now, but there will be, yeah, just real intentionality on making our spiritual path really one that includes love, both the obstacles to love and the presence of love. It's, there's, that should absolutely be not something separate than this path we're on together. Um, and I know we have some exciting things this weekend. Party down. Seriously. Uh, so Friday night, we have some fun things. Um, I highly recommend that people get on the mailing list or check the website out because that's obviously, and maybe I don't know if we have a social media presence because I don't have any social media, but um we might be there, but Friday night, you can come kind of late for old folks like me, um, eight to nine and bring your, uh, yoga mat and something cozy and have a sound bath. Mm. So that's like pretty delicious. It's a nice small space to do it in. And the woman that does it, Mary Zell is very lovely. And then on Saturday night, we have Indian classical music. So it's going to be a Sarod and a Tabla mm. for two hours in here. And it's a really nice space also to do that a different kind of sound bath. Um, and then there's some really cool stuff coming up. There's a class that's going to be on Tuesdays starting February 13th, which I think is next Tuesday. Yeah. So, yeah. Cause the 14th is when we're going to all come and hang out here. And that's Alma Tanasi. Um, mm -hmm. She's a nun that's a former nun that's taught here a lot. Um, I think she's only going to be online because, I, oh, it says hybrid. Interesting. She may be on zoom. There will be people in the space. So it's Tuesdays and it's trauma informed Satipatthana. Cool. So the Satipatthana suttas, breath, lots of stuff. So, um, which is a pretty cool sort of take on that. Um, and then there's some other cool stuff coming up. Um, there's an awareness and improv half day. Super fun. Um, that's online only. And that's sponsored by Santa Cruz insight of which we have a wonderful, one of Eve's beloved friends and a teacher that sometimes comes up here. Um, to like i don't know if she do you think i don't know how that got, i don't know if Tenson yeah. did that i don't know either. anyways pretty cool and then the last thing is that um this is like an amazing showing that's happening on wednesday nights and we need to keep the space open to have all the folks coming and um 
have the Dharma flowing. So we do want to say that while Dhamma is generosity, please like really consider it part of your practice. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want anyone to not be able to do other things financially in their life because it is hard to live in the Bay Area. And we recommend a 15 to $30 donation and have all sorts of interesting and fun ways to collect money mm. and i will be up at the desk yeah. to share those with you after class and i always forget but i'm teaching um I'm a flip oh one, one second i'm teaching a retreat in um oh, big, bear. big bear in april second week of april with ryan redman and i am teaching a, a similar retreat kind of based on emotion awareness at esalen the second week of may and that one was just open so there's still some space so yes what depends what's it about <laughs> we're going for trust find out. <laughs> so um exciting announcement that on march 28th thursday uh, tenzin wengo Rinpoche will be coming here to uh to the dharma collective mm -hmm. yeah oh that's is that yeah i just happened in the last breaking news yeah <laughs> march 28th cool well we're gonna have you're gonna really have to get some advanced seating for that yeah sweet wonderful the more i donate to the collective the better my business. Yeah. Hey. 